Hello, 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 and welcome uh, to this module E of uh, this American government course. Uh, and I want to say, and of course, my name is Daniel Kirsch. And um, I want to say first that this is a joint lecture, uh, maybe in two parts. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but it's about the media and public opinion, as well as lobbying and interest groups. Uh, and I assure you, there is a common theme. Uh, in kind of tying these together. One of them is that, you know, um, where is it that politics and policy actually comes from? Uh, and another is how does it actually get implemented? Uh, in other words, people might think one thing and maybe the way the government is actually conducted is entirely different. Um, you know, it's not completely removed from how people think of it, um, but it is several steps uh, removed from what public opinion actually tends to be uh, in terms of that versus the way policy actually gets crafted. And there are a couple, there's a couple of intermediaries uh, that I want to introduce you to today in terms of how we think about politics. And the first thing I want to talk about is just the way that we, in political science and social science, typically measure public opinion. Now, I've included some links uh, in the module, uh, in the public opinion and, and media and lobbying and interest groups module, uh, module E. And those links are to some data that you may or may not uh, have seen before or, or ever heard of. Uh, and that is the University of Michigan's um, ongoing, sometimes biennial or quadrennial public opinion survey. Uh, it is a voter survey. Uh, it's done through the Inter-University Inter Consortium for Political and Social Research. Uh, it's taken place since uh, it's the American National Election Study. It's taken place since 1948, uh, and the way the survey works, and it's kind of the gold standard, uh, is roughly 1,500 people uh, give their opinions. They get contacted. Uh, they're asked a series of questions. Uh, and they are randomly selected. So people are asked a series of questions about what they think about the political world, uh, how they voted this year or plan to vote this year, and certainly what is their background? Uh, what is their social background? Well, are they a man or a woman? Uh, and do they self-identify with a certain race uh, or religion? Uh, and when were they born? Where were they born? Um, what's their general political outlook? What are their opinion on very specific issues? A lot of very specific issues. What's their feeling toward different candidates? Uh, and and um, what political party do they consider themselves either a member of or at least lean towards? Um, and and uh, so all of those questions are asked in a very comprehensive way, uh, and that must take hours. Uh, the University of Michigan interviewers ask a randomly selected group of people what they think about all of these things. And it's provided a lot of useful information for political scientists to be able to determine what are some determining factors that cause people to think and act about politics the way that they do. Some of the things I mentioned, uh, like perhaps your religion, your religious affiliation or activity, but also perhaps your gender uh, and all of those things, uh, maybe your income level, all of those are potentially um, political socialization agents. Um, you may have heard the term if you've taken a sociology or psychology uh, or even anthropology course. So in social science, the way we say that things are socialization tools or agents, if they have a substantial effect or tend to have a substantial effect, on the way that we engage with the rest of the world. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen in a lot of survey responses uh, is that people often follow, and even if they don't mean to at first, they often follow or most of the time follow uh, the influence of their parents uh, when it comes to their political affiliations and general belief system. So in terms of priorities, uh, and they often, uh, they often fall into the same uh, socioeconomic category uh, as their parents did, uh, priorities of, of talking about this, um, these items. Uh, they have often the same kind of social background and often the same opinions. And the majority of the time, you know, we say that at least the initial political socialization agent is one's family. 
uh, from the time that you're born until the time you're an adult, uh, they kind of have the most consistent impact uh, on the way you think about um, very important or at least very central to you political issues uh, and possibly, you know, social, of course, social issues as well. So, pardon me. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a rule that you have to think what your parents thought. Uh, it's just that we're finding that most of the time that ends up being what uh, kind of shakes out. So as a result, we can also posit a lot of other related questions and theories knowing that kind of general information. One of them is simply that public opinion is a malleable thing. Uh, it can sometimes change and evolve over time, but there is a certain kind of baseline uh, within the electorate. However, public opinion is not static. It does change. Uh, and one of the ways it does change beyond just what your parents thought is through another political socialization agent, and that's the media. The media has an enormous influence on the way that we think and what we think about. Uh, it doesn't always have to be uh, monolithic, and, and uh, it doesn't always have to be telling you exactly what to think. It's just that the messages that we're surrounded with every day, and even more so now with mobile social media, um, we're constantly kind of checking to see what it is our friends think about something, or people that we trust, uh, or media outlets that we trust. Uh, what do they think about what's going on in the world? And kind of implicitly, maybe what should I think? What should I think uh, about what's going on in the world? You know, you may, you kind of, maybe we collectively lose the ability to trust our own instincts or judgment when it comes to the news, when we're constantly bombarded with news uh, and, and media and opinion uh, and, and all of these things. So we're, we're looking, we look towards, you know, trusted outlets to interpret things for us. Uh, and, and um, you know, more and more that is, uh, that's becoming uh, a very powerful influence uh, on, on all of our, our lives and our opinions. So we go, we go to the news not necessarily to go to know what's going on in the world, um, but to reinforce our worldview of what is going on in the world and what some trusted sources have said about recent events. So the media can only do so much, but they do serve a lot of purposes in political society. And before I move on from public opinion, I want to say one other thing, that a lot of the respondents in these public opinion surveys, uh, a lot of what they're saying to interviewers uh, and, and uh, in additional public opinion surveys besides the University of Michigan one I've been talking about, uh, is the Gallup poll uh, that tracks the president and their presidential tracking poll. And the most common question in it is, what kind of a job do you think the president is doing today? Uh, those are the questions that are asked every day by not only Gallup, uh, that company that's been around since at least the 1930s, um, but the entire polling industry asks questions like that. Um, but Gallup is kind of one of those gold standards um, in the polling industry. But they, they ask, how do you think the president is doing? Or, you know, when we get into an election year, uh, or which seems more and more often, um, who do you want to be president? So they ask public opinion polls about the next presidential election almost immediately after the previous presidential election is over. Uh, and so I'll talk more about that very soon. Uh, they ask, who, do you, who would you support if the election were held today? That's the way the question is typically asked. So there are literally thousands and thousands of public opinion surveys that take place every year in the United States. But the most popular ones always seem to be around who is going to win the next election. Because political parties always want to know, the media also always wants to know uh, the answer to that. And they do this kind of horse race coverage. Um, and by horse race, you know, we mean all the candidates are horses, right? And uh, who is going to win the race? And how is that? And, and of course, that's you can see that that's political because it 
because it matters to them. They're, they're going to be more powerful if they get into office. But what does it have to do? I mean, it seems like a fundamental and basic question, but I'll ask it anyway. What does it have to do with your life? Whether John Smith uh, or George Smith wins the office, right? Or Jane Smith or Georgiana Smith or anyone. What does it matter if they win, if they're not going to do anything that's related to the issues that affect your life? So electoral politics and sort of day-to-day policy-oriented politics, um, you can see which one gets more weight in the media and what we pay more attention to. And I don't know that that's, you know, I think there's, there's a large consensus uh, around media watchdogs, especially, but uh, in academia and, and just people who pay attention. Um, it's not really a good thing uh, to have the media only, but it's not for me to say, you know, it's just just kind of giving you my, my two cents. But um, the fact that it's a, we're only thinking about who wins the next election, how is that good for a democracy? That for four years out of every presidential election cycle is four, you know, there's a presidential term is four years long. We spend two of those years endlessly fraught with talking about who is going to win the next presidential election. A full two years post holidays after the midterms. Um, so in 2022, uh, there are midterms. And in 2022, there are midterms. And then after the 2022 midterms in 2023 and 2024, there, there will be certainly a, an outsized focus on who will be the next president uh, or who will win the next presidential election. So probably by effect to continue my script, uh, probably something like 10 to 1 they cover who's up, who's down, versus covering, you know, what's what's going on in government. Uh, or even versus what the priorities in the election itself actually are. So you try to stay informed about politics by reading or listening or watching the news in some way, but all you end up seeing is who's going to win or who should win the next election, based on that outlet's take. You don't really see what the business of government ends up being. And that's, you know, um, where lobbying and interest groups do come in. But I'll get to that in a second. Um, when those interviewers, those public opinion interviewers, are asking questions like, when was the last time you voted? Uh, one thing that the University of Michigan survey has gotten a lot of criticism for is that we only have about 50 uh, or 60 percent at most voter participation in this country. Um, that's just a fact. Uh, I mean, nationwide, we, we tend to have about on a good year, on a good presidential election year, maybe 60% turnout. Um, yeah, most of the time, the answer we come up with is that it's about 70 or 75% um, voter, voter turnout from the surveys. Um, so that can't be right. Right, so that must mean people are either lying or their sample is bad, which is possible. Um, so let me look at that question. So if they're lying, that means that people are guilty of something called social desirability bias. Uh, and that means social desirability bias means that you want to be liked by the person interviewing you because it's just a natural human tendency. Um, so it's a common and understandable behavior. Um, but then everything they say is suspect and they don't have a reason to lie necessarily other than that immediate social situation. Um, because it's anonymous. Um, but there is a judgment, of course, in all situations that's being made by the other person you're talking with. Um, but, you know, they ask questions like, when was the last time you voted? And that even presupposes that you voted before. Uh, or that voting is a good thing, because it's all we're talking about. So, of course, they're going to say, even if they didn't vote last time, oh, they voted, maybe they, they might lie. They might say, oh, I meant to. Um, instead of saying I meant to vote, they would just say, yes, I voted, and I voted for the Republican candidate or the Democratic candidate. So it's either that, that they, um, you know, there's, there's an answer that, that gives kind of an inaccurate number about who participated in the last election, uh, or the sample is bad, meaning that they oversampled 
from a population that tends to vote in elections. They didn't sample sort of a more representative look at, at the U.S. electorate. So I said uh, 1,500 people are selected, they're randomly selected, and, and historically a lot of um, survey firms and the University of Michigan as well used to use the phone book to randomly call people. And they would call up like 10,000 people and about 1,500 of them would answer, give or take. But it's not only on one night, it takes, it takes place over the course of an entire presidential election season. Uh, the people you answer, you know, were just randomly selected and they've done a lot of research uh, at least to theorize that they don't have different opinions than the rest of the population does. They're just randomly taking people from the population of people in the phone book. It's kind of a statistical principle that if you get over a certain number, I guess over 300 um, of, of any giant population, you are going to get basically a, a somewhat representative look uh, at what that entire population thinks and does. Well, today phone books uh, don't really exist in the way that they used to. Even even 20 years ago, I can tell you from somebody who lived and was an adult 20 years ago, um, you know, it's it just doesn't look the same. Uh, so they have other ways of finding people. Uh, I'm not sure actually where they get all of their information, um, but they do have somewhat of a random selection. But they're still working to get uh, a really accurate random sample of the population. But the key thing to know is that the larger the sample size, the better it is. Uh, the more accurate of a read you have uh, of a population, as long as that sample is random. So if it's not entirely random, if, for example, you were to still use the phone book today because that has a huge generational skew, um, so like anyone under 30 and possibly most people under 40 don't really have a landline. Um, I think that's absolutely true, actually, now that I say that. Um, so that's just a rudimentary problem the polling industry it's still trying to overcome, but they try to get um, just a random selection of people. And you can get a random selection of a population, but the lowest you can probably have is about 50 in a survey that's uh, kind of a based, it has a questionnaire uh, that, that works that way. So public opinion is important um, because, you know, the people living under a system of government and hopefully a democracy uh, think one way or think many ways about what the government is doing and what should be done, what ought to be done, and how it directly affects them. And public opinion is kind of a strange, uh, untamable beast because, you know, there's um, the public can be fickle. Uh, they can like one candidate one year and another another year. Uh, they might like a candidate who was in a scandal. They might not like another person who was involved in a similar scandal. Um, they might like a candidate one year because they got a big tax cut uh, from that candidate when they were in office last. They might not like a candidate because they lost their job the next year. But that person hasn't really changed. That candidate themselves hasn't really changed. It's just the circumstance uh, and their relationship to it. Uh, or it's what a voter has heard from trusted news outlets or TV or paper, the newspaper or the internet. Uh, they've seen different things on their social media feed they have can, that have convinced them to completely change their mind about something. So the media is, is uh, debatable in a democratic society, but it's supposed to, the function of the media is, um, is, is debatable in a democratic society, I should say. But it's supposed to keep people informed. The media doesn't often just keep people informed in a way that is necessarily constructive to their behavior in a democracy. So in a democracy, and the reason I say it that way, uh, instead of just, you know, a system of government or any other kind of republic, is that a democracy specifically can only function, and pretty much all democratic theorists think this, if there is a well-informed and thoroughly informed electorate uh, and public. So in a democracy, it matters particularly what public opinion is. It also makes a difference about how they get their information and what information that is and what they end up kind of digesting and how they process it. Uh, all of those things matter a great deal. But the thing is with the media has been undergoing a vast transformation in the US uh, and all over the world the last 30 years with the growth of the internet. Uh, one thing that's been a consequence of this is that local media has really been starved for resources. About 90% of the revenue they used to count on is gone. Uh, the local lever has 
the local level, sorry, has really gone completely towards not just the big tech media giants like Google and Facebook, uh, but it's also gone towards other ways of targeting people through advertising that sometimes tend to be just Google and Facebook also. Uh, so the resources from local businesses to try to stay afloat have been either sort of killed off by big giants like Amazon, or they've ended up having to advertise as small businesses do through online platforms, like I've already mentioned. So local newspapers that used to, for one thing, be the ones who did all the investigative journalism uh, are really almost out of business uh, and at least severely depleted from what they used to be. And that used to be the principal way that in-depth reporting and critique used to take place of elected officials. Now it's almost entirely reliant on advertising from either the campaigns themselves, political campaigns themselves, or political parties themselves, or at least sympathetic media sources that, not, that are not in any way pretending to be unbiased. So like an objective kind of informed electorate doesn't really occur in the same way as it did today versus 30 years ago. And so in light of that, public opinion has become really um, solidified on both sides of the aisle. Uh, it really has. And I don't say that to draw an equivalent between left and right, uh, just in terms of the way the media uh, is, is the strength of these different kind of media orientations are functioning. I only say that to say there, there are very few unaffected media outlets by this transformation. Uh, all of them have been affected in some way, uh, but this solidification of partisanship uh, is, is what we're still undergoing. And it's fair to say that about the same number of people trust a certain group of news outlets versus another group of news outlets. And that's problematic because it means there's no common discourse. Uh, it means that it's, it's it's hard to call something that doesn't engage with other citizens in a systematic way a democracy. So that's kind of what the media's role has been and is now. Uh, it's more of a solidification and the media is called the media because it's the medium um, between events and the way that they're filtered to the public. And not just events, uh, but powerful interests, the people who make political decisions for thousands of millions of people, thousands and millions of people, the media is the medium between which um, that information is between between them and between the way the information is conveyed to the people. Because of that, the role in a democracy is supposed to keep people informed and be and you're supposed to be able to criticize, you know, uh, potentially those powerful what those powerful people are doing. So because it's it's sort of broken. You know, it's sort of broken, or at least it's arguably broken. There's a lot of room for interested parties, most often corporations and alliances between uh, those corporations, who would rather see government, for example, in Washington, D.C., or in any of the state capitals, uh, or in any city government, or local or county government, doing what might not be in the public interest, but might be in some narrow or private interests. The way that gets accomplished is not through advertising campaigns uh, and that, um, that argue in public about uh, the way to steer government in a certain way to do a certain thing. It's not. It's, for example, they want to give a company a tax break or a regulation exemption. They want to get one for themselves or their, their allies. They don't advertise uh, those specific kinds of things for people to change their opinions about how much money should be given to a corporation by a government. Instead, they will directly lobby. It's called lobbying. Uh, they will communicate with government and elected officials in government and unelected government officials to try to change either the way government treats them, that entity, that corporate entity, uh, or they try to get them to change the laws in the way that they're always that, um, let me say that a different way. Uh, they either try to get the government to treat them differently uh, with the existing laws, or they try to change the laws so that permanently entities like theirs are treated in a more favorable way to the entities, to themselves. 
So lobbying is very, very effective uh, and when it's done behind closed doors and with a lot of money. And what is lobbying? I mean, effectively, it's just providing information and resources that will end up favoring um, whatever is good or uh, what is good for whoever is doing the lobbying. Um, so it could be, for example, that you're kind of a national soda bottling alliance. I'm really just, I made this up. I don't know if this exists in reality at all. Um, a few brands like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, okay? So let's say they joined forces and they had their own kind of soda bottling association. They would try to get maybe a tax break for all soda bottling companies, or they would try to get a labor exemption, where they might try to call all of their employees independent contractors uh, so they wouldn't have to follow labor law like minimum wage or health and safety uh, regulations uh, to keep keep workers safe. Um, any of that they can do, if they, can, if they can do it if they can convince the rule makers, members of Congress uh, or members of state legislatures, um, to change the rules in their favor or to spend more money to give them a tax break uh, on developing more soda bottling plants that are held, that are owned by existing soda bottling companies. And so, you know, who do you think is going to win a lobbying battle between Pepsi and Coca-Cola or the labor union who maybe represents all of the soda bottling uh, company workers? Um, I mean, the labor union, think about the profits that are raked in, the billions and billions of dollars uh, that, that um, they have. So in terms of money about, about and lobbying resources, um, they are going to get top flight lobbyists, uh, Coke and Pepsi. But if there was a labor union that represents maybe, uh, maybe the workers who work in those bottling plants, uh, are they going to be able to hire a big lobby? They're going to be able to hire lobbyists for sure. Um, but we're talking about a budget that's in like the tens of millions as opposed to for a labor, for a large, really large labor union like that, uh, versus maybe, a, maybe a hundred million, maybe. Um, but that's even, that's really high. Um, but we're talking billions of dollars in just profits alone, let alone revenue, uh, from, so from Coke and Pepsi. So they're going to get the best lobbyists they can get. And what kind is that? Well, let's read on and see. Um, so the kind of thing that lobbyists try to do is they'll car try to carve out a lot of exceptions for their clients, whether they're internal or external lobbyists. They could be people that are working directly for the soda bottling companies. Uh, or they could be an outside lobbying firm like, you know, a law firm uh, that's been hired to persuade members of Congress what to do. Um, the best kind of lobbyists are usually former members of Congress, uh, and that's sort of how they cash in. So, for example, a member of Congress, um, as a member of Congress, makes about $200,000 a year plus medical benefits, and after one term, they get those same benefits and that same salary the rest of their lives. So that's really, really good money, uh, and that's really good benefits. But it's not as good as you know you're, when you're then hired by or start your own lobbying firm and get a, get a lot of uh, really big corporate clients. You could stand to make millions upon millions of dollars every year. Yeah, there's there's too many of those to count that I can really recall. But you know I won't name it. I won't name any of those names. But um, I won't know any of those names. But people like Trent Lott and Billy Towson. Uh, and all those other people that were really big leaders in the 1990s ended up founding their own lobbying firms, uh, getting a lot of money from large corporations to sell ideas and accept exemptions um, to members of Congress because they know that members of Congress listen to their own. Uh, most of all, and lobbyists that speak to them in their language know what their interests are and kind of how to put themselves in their shoes. So lobbying strategies are often kind of... Uh, inside and they're behind closed doors and they just try to get as much favorable treatment for their clients uh, or themselves as they can. And to do that, they hire the most persuasive people who are often former members of Congress and who are uh, themselves often attorneys. So besides being attorneys in government relations firms or in-house counsels for a corporation, another strategy that many people, that many companies employ to try to get favorable treatment from the government which matters a great deal to them because it can cost them billions of dollars for a regulation they don't want to follow or a tax break they want to get, is they try to undermine the legal structure that employees, um, 
that employees have to live under and that regulate their industry. To do this, they will often try to litigate the cases all the way to the Supreme Court because they have the money to keep paying the lawyers to do that. And uh, to invalidate laws, um, they don't always sue you know, directly. They're not always a party to a lawsuit to invalidate laws. But what they do is they, they um, have a friend of the court br brief. It's called an amicus brief. Amicus is Latin for friend. Um, but a friend of the court brief that will give them a favorable uh, outcome and it doesn't carry any legal weight. It's just meant to show that this particular lobbying firm or interest group has some kind of interest in the outcome of this case. And that may matter to the justices deciding it. Uh, or it could matter to the rest of the lobbying community. They just want to know uh, it could matter to their membership or their clients who just want to see they're doing everything they can. Uh, that brings me that there are maybe one or two other questions I sort of have to deal with in this lecture. And that is that lobbying isn't always about being behind closed doors. It's not always about corporations. Sometimes it's about representing the interests in public of a mass membership citizen interest group. And that could be a citizen interest group like the League of Conservation Voters uh, or the AARP, which used to be called the American Association of Retired Persons, um, who, who lobby for Social Security and Social Security maintenance. Um, but those mass memberships are usually called citizen groups. Sometimes they have a lot of money donated to them from their members, uh, and they have charitable arms, they have political arms, but one type of citizen group um, that lobby and don't have as much uh, resources and money as corporate interests and business associations do uh, on Capitol Hill um, is... Uh, is, uh, you know, labor unions are one, we'll talk about that in a minute. But citizens groups like the League of Conservation Voters, National Organization for Women, or any number of other organizations that represents environmental or social justice causes, they can have different kinds of political and legal arms, but, um, but one that doesn't have a, a, another arm, really, is, is labor unions. Labor unions used to be a lot more powerful, but and they still very much dominate uh, in terms of their leadership, there's a lot of overlap between Democratic Party leadership and labor union leadership. There's still some overlap, um, but by and large, labor unions have been weakened a lot in the United States, and even in the Democratic Party. Um, part of the reason for that, just one part of the reason for that, is that labor unions can't really, um, in the, through the tax code, ask for charitable donations. Uh, they get most of their money from membership dues and fees. So they don't, they're not really in the money-making business, and so they don't. Uh, there was a Supreme Court decision in the last couple of years I'm not going to get into, uh, but suffice to say it's really weakened the ability of labor unions to even have revenue from the, um, from the workers that they are protecting. So now they're very weakened uh, financially, and they kind of, uh, but they're still wanting to push the country and public policy in a more kind of, you know, average worker friendly uh, direction. They're not as effective at doing that oftentimes because they don't have this, the same money to throw around. Uh, I did provide a link in opensecrets.org which details all of this uh, campaign finance money that uh, and, and that businesses donate a lot more money than labor unions do in terms of trying to persuade members of Congress to vote uh, the way that they should. Uh, one way they do that is not necessarily through lobbying um, on one issue or another, using money to kind of um, persuade members of Congress to vote a certain way who are already in office. Um, but what they try to do is donate money to candidates. So labor unions do this too, and corporations and special interest groups of all kinds do this as well. Um, but the one reason they donate money to candidates is those candidates often win. Uh, it's kind of a circle of logic here. But when they win, they know who their friends are. So instead of being lobbied directly on an issue, they'll take a look at how this affects potentially, um, most political scientists think anyway, uh, a candidate or representative might look at how this issue affects the people who have donated to their campaign. And the reason that matters so much um, to them is that it's been calculated, I don't know the exact number, um, but members of Congress, for example, have to raise something like $10,000 a day from the time they're elected uh, to the end of their term in order to have enough money to run the next time. So it's a lot of money, some number like that. They have to start fundraising immediately. So they're nothing if they're not able to retain their seat in Congress. Uh, and that 
that great kind of pay and benefit structure and, and future maybe as a lobbyist, without all that, um, their existing donors and, and uh, kind of making sure that they're protected, um, they, they, they won't be able to do anything if they're not you know, in Congress. So they'll even do something to the detriment of the people who actually voted them in it will, if it will benefit a donor or a group of donors. So if that's true, then campaign finance is, in addition to public opinion, and maybe even more than public opinion, maybe even more than even the media matters. Matters Campaign finance might matters a great deal to actual behavior. Forget the rhetoric of political candidates. Um, and yeah, the media and public opinion can really be affected by the rhetoric of candidates, but in terms of the behavior of politicians, once they get into office, you more need to pay attention less to the media and public opinion than you do to the people who are donating to their campaign, the lobbyists that they regularly communicate with in terms of what their priorities are. Um, so. so that's uh, that's mostly all I have for today uh, in terms of this entire thing. There's a lot more in the two chapters about membership in these citizens groups as well as public opinions. Uh, and of course you have to, you know, complete the other work in the module, but I wanted to give you some of the broad outlines about how these concepts are covered. Um, there is one additional um, piece of information I could lecture on here, but I think I'll, I'll leave that uh, alone and, uh, and I will maybe bring it up during class. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, this multi-tiered lecture about different things. And if you have questions about it still, please ask them in class or email me. Otherwise, uh, have a really good day and enjoy, um, enjoy this module one way or another. All right. Thanks for watching.